Welcome everyone to this very uh, timely and important conversation at the Price School. Uh, I'm here today with uh, Sandy Darity and Kirsten Mullen, who are here to talk about their book, From Here to Equality, A Conversation on Reparations for Black Americans. Uh, Sandy uh, Darity is the Sammy DeBose uh, Cook Professor of Public Policy, African American and uh, American Studies and Economics, and the director of the Sammy DeBose Center on Social um, Equity at Duke University. His research focuses on inequality by race, class, and ethnicity, stratification, economics, schooling, and the uh, racial achievement gap, the economics of reparations, the history of economics, and the social psycholo psychological effects of exposure to unemployment. Uh, Kirsten Mullen is a folklorist and the founder of Artifactual and Arts Consulting Practice and uh, Carolina um, Circuit Writers, a literary consortium that brings expressive writers of colors to the Carolinas. Uh, she's a member of the development team that was awarded the Smithsonian Institutions Commission uh, to design the National uh, Museum of African American History and Culture. Truly, it is an honor to have you here today. And we're gonna start with some, um, I know that uh, you're gonna have uninterrupted remarks as we get started. But again, thank you for joining us uh, at Price. And thank you for, again, uh, this amazing piece of work. So please, however you wanna proceed. And again, we will have questions after those initial remarks and then um, uh, we'll uh, open up to the audience. So please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Lewis. So we're, glad to, uh, we're glad to be here at the Price School. And uh, we always cherish the opportunity to talk about the case for reparations for Black American descendants of U.S. slavery. Um, and Kirsten's going to open our presentation with, uh, with the remarks that she's about to provide. Thank you so much. So I'd like to start with the Kerner Report uh, and its description of the events leading up to the 1965 Watts riot. So the commission wrote, in the spring of 1965, the nation's attention shifted back to the South when civil rights workers staged a nonviolent demonstration in Selma, Alabama. Police and state troopers forcibly interrupted their march. Within the next few weeks, racists murdered a white clergyman and a white housewife active in civil rights. Um, that white clergyman uh, who was murdered was Episcopal priest and social justice activist Jonathan Myrick Daniels. And his murder and the murdered white housewife that they mentioned was a woman named Viola Liuzzo. Uh, I learned their names at a very early age because my mother took my sister and me to uh, the 1965 protest march that was organized in Fort Worth, Texas, where we lived. Um, this was the same summer of the marches from um, Selma to, to Montgomery, Alabama. Uh, Liuzzo was gunned down in Selma, and Father Daniels was murdered in Haynesville. Uh, Haneyville, uh, when he took a bullet for the black 17 year old voter registration organizer, Ruby Sales. Uh, they had the misfortune of walking into a local store to purchase something to drink, uh, but their presence angered the store clerk, a volunteer county deputy named Tom Coleman, who shot at Sales but killed Daniels. Uh, the current report goes on to mention Negro demonstrations in Bogalusa, Louisiana. Um, those, those demonstrators were attacked by whites. And then on the 11th of August, um, let's see, on the 11th of August, they continue, uh, a Los Angeles sweltering, sweltered in the heat wave, uh, highway patrolman hailed a young Negro driver for speeding. Um, the young man appeared intoxicated. The patrolman arrested him. As the crowd gathered, law enforcement officers were called to the scene. Highway patrolman mistake, mistakenly struck a bystander with his billy club. Uh, a young Negro woman who was accused of spitting on the police was dragged into the middle of the street. When the police departed, members of the crowd began hurling rocks at passing cars, beating white motorists and overturning cars and setting them on fire. The police reacted hesitantly. Actions they did take further inflamed the people on the streets. Um, so, you know, few, so then they go on to give a little bit more detail about what happened over the next 30 hours or so. And then they continue, few police were on hand the next morning when huge crowds gathered in the business district of Watts, two miles from the location of the original disturbance and began looting. In the absence of a police response, the looters became bolder, spread into other areas. Hundreds of men, women, children uh, from five housing projects clustered in or near Watts. Uh, the upshot being 
Uh, the National Guard is called in, uh, but they arrived. You know, it took several hours for them to, to appear on the scene. And by the time they came, uh, you know, some 4,000 people had been arrested, 34 people were killed, hundreds were injured, and approximately $35 million in damage had been inflicted. Um, the LA County, uh, the, you know, this riot, this particular riot, uh, the worst in the United States since the Detroit riot of 1943, uh, shocked all of those who had been uh, who had been confident that race relations were improving in the North uh, and provoked a new mood in Negro ghettos across the country. So, um, you know, the LA riots were representative of urban uprisings uh, of 1960, virtually all of which were responses to police abuses of Black youth. Um, so uh, the last quote I want to, to share with you from the Kerner Report, um, where they write, we have cited deep hostility between police and ghetto communities as a primary cause of the disorders surveyed by the commission in Newark, Detroit, Watts, and Harlem, in practically every city that has experienced racial disruption since the summer of 1964, abrasive relationships between police and Negroes and other minority groups have been major sources of grievance, tension, and ultimately disorder. So the, the story that uh, Kirsten just shared is one that is focused on, uh, on uprisings that took place in predominantly Black communities in the United States. And those uprisings were heavily concentrated in the 1960s. It's interesting that those uprisings generated a report that we now refer to as the Kerner Commission's report. But there's never been a report taken or developed at the national level that addressed the waves of white massacres that took place in the United States from the end of the Civil War into the 1940s. Uh, these white massacres are indicative of a pattern that's associated with the destruction of black lives and the destruction or appropriation of black owned property. And in the context of thinking about the Watts riot as being representative of something that has taken place historically, it's representative of the role of anti-black police violence. But the riots that were conducted by white mobsters throughout the interval from the end of the Civil War into the 1940s were riots that were executed for the purposes of destroying evidence of black prosperity, and for the purposes of suppressing Black participation in the political process. So the motivations were quite different. Uh, the atrocities that took place in California were part of a national process of sustained damage and harm to Black Americans whose ancestors had been enslaved in the United States. Uh, one of the reasons this is the case is the uh, a highly, highly underreported pres presence of the Confederacy in the Western states of the United States. In fact, I, I would argue uh, that the evidence that we've assembled suggests that we grossly underestimate the reach and influence of the cause of the Confederacy across the nation. Uh, the Golden State itself has been in many ways a gray state. In, 19, in 1849, 1849, during a convening to create the state of California, legislators eventually decided to ban slavery, but they were hostile to the idea of living alongside free blacks. In an address to his fellow elected officials in Sacramento, the inaugural government, Peter Hardiman Burnett wrote, it would be no favor and no kindness to permit free blacks to settle in the state, while it would be a most serious injury to us. Had they been born here, and had acquired rights and consequence, I should not recommend any measure to expel them, but the object is to keep them out. Now, evidently Burnett, who himself was born into a slave-holding family and would own two black bodies himself, did not deem it hypocritical that he personally had been born in Nashville, Tennessee, but had lived in Oregon previously to coming to California. Burnett had in fact served as Oregon's provisional Supreme Judge and had penned what became known as the Peter Burnett Lash Law, so named for the penalty, no fewer than 20 and as many as 39 lashes on one spare back that would be applied to blacks who entered the territory in or after 1844. 
and measures of this type would remain legal in Oregon until 1926. During and after the Civil War, a steady stream of Confederates made their way to California. In uh, the pages of From Here to Equality, we actually document two such transplants. We say the following. South Carolina brothers, physicians, and scientists, Joseph and John LeConte, were enslavers of Black people. John the Elder was looking forward to the creation of a new university under the Confederacy where his work would flourish. But then the Union Army entered Columbus, South Carolina, and at that point, he and his family left the city with more than 20 human beings who were their property. Both brothers landed on their feet after the Civil War ended, and in 1869, moved to California to join the faculty at the new university in Berkeley. John joined the physics faculty and became acting president. He would eventually serve as the permanent university head from 1876 to 1881. Now, when the Lacants were hired, an embittered geologist, J.B. Cooper, who had hoped to become a faculty member, complained that Lacant had gotten the job because there were Confederate sympathizers among the Board of Regents. And he added that the university was being made into a perfect asylum for ex-rebel professors. Now, California did not support the Union effort financially, but the Confederacy and the Democratic Party were the kingpins in Santa Clara, Monterey, San Francisco, and San Joaquin counties. In 1861, a fraction, uh, a faction in San Francisco made an unsuccessful attempt to join with Oregon and secede from the Union. So clearly, the power of the Confederacy extended far beyond the South and beyond the period of the Civil War. So looking again at the nation, uh, in Tulsa, Oklahoma, white supremacists commandeered airplanes and firebombed black businesses and homes from the sky. This attack strategy was reminiscent of one that was used by white mobsters who attacked members of Los Angeles's Chinese community in 1871. Uh, they armed themselves with pickaxes and climbed atop Chinese owned businesses, hacked holes in the roofs and shot their hysterical targets. As far as we are able to tell, uh, African-Americans were not involved in that uh, late 19th century uh, violence. But many of the white terror campaigns in other parts of the country were explicitly about preventing Blacks from engaging in the franchise. Whites used intimidation, threats, and violence to keep Black Republicans. Uh, this is back when the Republicans, this is the Republican Party of Lincoln uh, and their allies from the polls. And when those tactics were not successful, they ran the duly elected radical Republicans out of town or murdered them outright. This was the case in Colfax, 1873, and Cushada, Louisiana, 1874, in Wilmington, North Carolina, 1898, and Atlanta, Georgia, 1906. Um, you know, interestingly, the strategies that were used in Atlanta were copied from the, the horrible but ultimately successful uh, white massacre in Wilmington, North Carolina. And then in 1919, Elaine, Arkansas, Chicago, Illinois, uh, Omaha, Nebraska, Washington, DC, Baltimore, Maryland, but also Bisbee, Arizona, Garfield Park, Illinois, and Wilmington, Delaware, uh, part of what was later called the Red Summer. Uh, and in Ocoee, Florida, 1920, and Greenwood District uh, in Tulsa, Oklahoma, 1921. Uh, Newell G. Bringhurst uh, and David C. Chalmers, these are historians who write about the Klan during this period, identify Tulare uh, County in central San Joaquin Valley, especially Visalia, the county seat, as, quote, the center of Klan activity beginning in the mid-1920s. The Klan operated out in the open during these decades. In Los Angeles, the Klan targeted Black families that attempted to desegregate white neighborhoods. Uh, they were said to have terrorized Black ocean lovers on Bruce Beach and, and set fires at the Willa and Charles uh, Bruce property on several occasions. Um, you know, the LA freeway, uh, you know, we don't always think about, you know, all of the, the ways that, that Black people were disadvantaged by the freeways, but the LA freeway is a monument to racism and segregation. In 1910, at least 36% of Blacks were homeowners compared with 2% at the same time in New York City. Black people have been displaced or trapped by networks of highways in the, same, in the name of progress 
and to create greater access to parks and commercial spaces for white Americans. Highway systems claimed thousands of black people's homes through eminent domain. Black community spaces like Hollenbeck Park were carved up while local planning departments engage in extreme efforts to keep white parks and neighborhoods intact. 1910 to 1930, Los Angeles grew from 320,000 uh, people with famously integrated neighborhoods like Watts and Boyle Heights to 1.2 million newcomers, including tens of thousands of Southern Blacks. White residents put, um, you know, began to put Jim Crow practices uh, into, into place these racially restrictive covenants became the rule. Redlining, a hallmark of the National Housing Act of 1934, uh, homeowners loan corporation ranked neighborhoods by security, quote, and desirability, end quote. Uh, you know, properties were clustered into color-coded areas and graded A through D. Blacks could not live in green zones, the most desirable, and they could not get an FHA-backed loan in a red zone. Much of the work of attaching racially restrictive covenants was done by the LA Realty Board. Their policies were adopted across the state and the country. Uh, Dodger Stadium is just one example, uh, cut through the Chavine, uh, Chavez Ravine, um, had a major impact on East Los Angeles, uh, but funding for these eminent domain purchases from the FHA started in 1950. The, the key thing that we'd want to emphasize in, in, in closing our opening remarks is, uh, is the fact that uh, these chains of events uh, were responsible for creating the racial wealth gap that we observe today in the United States. And we can start with the immediate aftermath of the Civil War when the formerly enslaved did not receive the 40 acre land grants that they were promised in restitution for their years of bondage, while one and a half million white American families received from the United States government 160 acre land grants in the Western territories as the nation completed its process of colonial settlement. Uh, and these uh, 160 acre land grants were the foundation for a significant amount of wealth that is currently held by white Americans. Uh, Trina William Shanks estimates that there are at least 45 million living white Americans who are beneficiaries of the land grants that were provided to, uh, to, to previous generations and their families. Uh, during the, uh, the period of, of Jim Crow segregation in the United States, we've mentioned the wave upon wave of white terrorist attacks that took place that resulted in the destruction or appropriation of black owned property, thus widening the racial wealth differential. Uh, subsequent to that in the 20th century, when the, uh, the focus of federal policy shifted away from the provision of assets from the federal government in the form of land to providing individuals with support for home ownership. The application of those policies was conducted in such a deeply discriminatory, discriminatory fashion, fashion that uh, it, it permitted whites to uh, enter into the middle class in large numbers while preventing blacks from doing the same. Uh, and we would highlight among that, those pieces of legislation that. The, uh, the, the bills that were, were passed to introduce the Federal Housing Administration during the 1930s and the execution of the GI Bill in the aftermath of World War II. And then Kirsten made mention of the freeway system and how that had had an impact on the black community in Los Angeles. This was again a nationwide phenomenon. The use of the interstate system became a mechanism for destroying many black communities, particularly the black business districts in, uh, in, in those locations. Uh, and so it's actually federal policy that has laid, laid at the heart of the, uh, the creation and construction of the racial wealth gap. And that racial wealth gap amounts to a condition in which the average black household in the United States has approximately $840,000 less in net worth than the average white household. Uh, it has resulted in a situation that corresponds to a circumstance where black Americans who have ancestors who were enslaved in the United States and who were denied the 40 acres that were promised in the aftermath of the Civil War constitute about 12% of the nation's population, but only possess less than 2% of the nation's wealth. 
And so the focal point for our case for reparations is, is the claim that the federal government should remediate the circumstances of inequality with respect to wealth that their its own policies have produced. And that remediation would require uh, the provision of a sum of at least $11 trillion uh, as a compensatory payment to restore or to establish for the first time, probably, uh, balance between the Black uh, proportion of the nation's population and the Black share of the nation's wealth. Um, and so I, I think we'll, we'll stop there and, and open up uh, the floor for the conversation. Um, thank you so much for that amazing uh, opening and for taking the time to uh, localize it, uh, particularly with examples in uh, LA and California. Uh, it just kind of br brings things home in a different way, and I appreciate that. As I was reading the book, I was struck by what, what kept coming to mind What for me was the tyranny of almost. Mm -hmm. uh, the fact that over and over again, we have these forks in the road when in our nation building, in our policy development, we had an opportunity to do the right thing and we chose the other path. Um, and so even after those multiple iterations, uh, you talk in the book about the fact that you're hopeful that maybe this time is different. And so can you talk a little bit about those forks in the road and again, also why you think that this time uh, may be different? Maybe we can start with the very beginning, um, you know, when the nation made a decision to establish itself as a republic that legalized slavery. I mean, that didn't have to be the case. We could have begun as a nation uh, where everyone was free and where everyone enjoyed full citizenship rights, but that's absolutely not what was decided. Um, you know, and then, you know, at, during various points when uh, the nation was at war with other countries, that would have been another possible time to say, you know, everyone who is engaged in helping us, you know, to, to, uh, to remain independent, to remain free, will also be made free. But that didn't happen either. Um, and in fact, there were, you know, more laws that were created to, um, to solidify this connection of blackness with slavery, uh, making it much more difficult for, you know, that trend to be, to, to be reversed. Um, and then, you know, coming up, you know, through, um, the Civil War, again, you know, you had, you know, significant numbers of Black uh, men and women who fought with the Union and supported the Union effort. Um, but it wasn't in entirely clear, you know, uh, uh, until, you know, as, you know, until the war was deep, you know, deep into the, the years of the war, um, that it was important to uh, enable them to join the forces. Uh, and, uh, but, but I'm saying just you know, slow, 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 slow efforts, you know, were made. And then as Sandy uh, mentioned at the end of the Civil War, uh, here was a terrific moment when reparations could have been paid to, uh, you know, Black people who had been enslaved and, and also as uh, payment for their ancestors who had been enslaved all those years um, in the form of land grants. And that was a huge moment, I think. Um, you know, we were so close, it seemed. Um, and, but even then, um, you know, white Americans were being given, you know, 160 acre land grants and, uh, you know, new emancipated black people being promised 40. So already you've got a four to one disadvantage and then uh, the black people were given nothing. Um, so, you know, and then we sort of start looking at, uh, so the Homestead Acts certainly uh, for white Americans and the denial of the 40 acre land grants for black Americans was a huge moment, mm -hmm. a huge fork in the road. And that is the one, you know, where we, you know, for us, that is where the racial wealth gap is born. You know, that, that's where, it, that's, that's the origin story for the racial wealth gap. Um, but, uh, you know, saying we'll maybe start talking a bit about just all the ways that the federal government um, not, not maintained and helped to ex, uh, enlarge that racial wealth gap through its own policies. Well, and, you know, in principle, in the 20th century, uh, had the New Deal been executed in an equitable fashion, it would have made a substantial difference in terms of uh, economic opportunity, and economic security for for black families. Um, it would be uh, a very different world had the New Deal from the outset included uh, domestic laborers and, and farm workers instead of being crafted uh, in such a way that it explicitly excluded them from the benefits of the New Deal, benefits that 
their families didn't have access to until the mid 1960s with the uh, onset of the Great Society programs. And people frequently think of the Great Society programs as, uh, as an initiative that provided uh, blacks with benefits that uh, no one else had ever received. But in fact, uh, the Great Society programs actually reversed the exclusion of Blacks from the benefits that were designated under the New Deal. And then, of course, as we pointed out, uh, the returning veterans from World War II, the Black returning veterans from World War II, were largely excluded from access to the provisions of the GI Bill that supported home buying opportunities. Uh, and then we move into the civil rights era, where uh, the legislation that was introduced largely brought down uh, formal or official patterns of segregation in the society, but did very little to alter the economic differentials that existed between blacks and whites. And so, um, you know, as, as you said, uh, these are lost opportunities that the nation for, has, has foregone in a number of instances. Uh, I think we're, we, we are uh, not excessively optimistic. I mean, we didn't get on this path because we thought that reparations would immediately occur. I mean, reparations hasn't taken place for 156 years. Uh, but, uh, but I think we got on this path because we're absolutely convinced that this is the right thing to do from the standpoint of the health and well-being of American society, as well as the health and well-being of Black America. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I, I think we frequently like to say, if it was 1819 and you didn't believe that slavery would ever come to an end, does that mean you shouldn't resist slavery if you have some capacity to do so? And, uh, and we think the answer to that is obviously no, you should resist you should have resisted slavery, uh, regardless of what your degree of optimism was about the prospects for slavery coming to an end. And we feel somewhat the same about reparations. It's the right thing to do. Uh, we want to make the case for it. We want to be advocates for it, uh, regardless of whether or not it's something that will be actualized in any near term. Uh, but Kirsten might have some thoughts about why we might have a basis for a bit more optimism in the present moment. Yeah, we do. Yeah. Um, Although I do want to say, you know, in the uh, this moment uh, of the pandemic, we know that the the funds that were made available for businesses that were struggling were and are continuing to struggle uh, as a consequence of the shutdowns. That black businesses, you know, received far less money than they requested and far less money than they needed. So this pattern of you know government policies disadvantaging black uh, Americans since the U.S. slavery continues. But um, but yes. Uh, there have been several polls that have been conducted about this question. Um, so 20 years ago, uh, scholars at the University of Chicago, uh, Ravana Popoff and Michael Dawson, uh, surveyed uh, the, the public and, this, and learned at that time, 20 years ago, that only 4% of white Americans uh, supported a program of reparations. Then uh, a second poll four years ago, uh, so 16 years later, uh, found that just about 16% of white Americans were in favor. So about you know, one percentage point per year. Then uh, at the end of last summer, uh, you know, the, the tumultuous summer, uh, a, a third poll by civics was conducted that found that just over 30% of white Americans were on board with this notion and nearly a majority of young white Americans also supported it. Now, majority of black people at each point not not a not a hundred percent, but a, uh, but a but a majority of black people at, at, at each of these stages, uh, each of these polls, were you know were uh, supportive of a reparations movement. Now we don't have a crystal ball, uh, so we don't know if the trend is going to continue in this way. And of course, look, you know the, the the devil's in the details. You know what do, what do all these folks mean when they dis, when they speak of a reparations program? You know, for us. You know, it is one that has at its heart, in the center, the elimination of the racial wealth gap. As Sandy said, this $840,000, $50,000 household uh, deficit, this median household deficit that needs to be addressed. So you know, there's a lot of room for conversation um, about these issues. Um, and we think this is a perfect time uh, 
and we, you know, are, are very happy, you know, that our, you know, our, that we're part of this conversation and that our work is helping to move this discussion along and to help educate the public too about, you know, what is meant by reparations and how, you know, how you can distinguish it from things like these racial equity programs that we're seeing popping up all over the country. Thank you for that. Um, and I want to kind of uh, follow up. I'm going to ask you specifics about, um, again, the, the, the detail specification that you put forward in terms of what that reparations plan could look like. Uh, but before that, I want to talk a little bit about um, the critiques uh, that have come your way in terms of this, the, the conversation around uh, reparations, uh, everything from you know, um, I wasn't around then, I didn't own slaves. Haven't we done affirmative action? Won't this just create animosity between blacks and whites? Uh, and uh, the you, the list goes on. I think there are, there are maybe 14. And so as you kind of think about, again, this conversation, uh, would you, are there particular cr critiques uh, that you're particularly concerned about that if we don't respond to those well, we're not gonna move the needle? Or has there been anything new that's come forward in the last year? But again, as you listen to, again, the responses or the critiques of the work, what stands out the most? And again, comes up over and over again that we've got to address again if we're going to move forward at this time. Well, I, th I think, uh, you know, uh, one of the chapters of our book is devoted explicitly to uh, a set of these conventional critiques, as, as you know, uh, the 12th chapter. And uh, uh, if 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 folks are going to uh, uh, to read the book for the first time, I think that that's a chapter that will be of of great interest. Uh, we tried to catalog kind of the standard things that we've heard in the process of going around the country and talking about reparations, the standard kinds of complaints or objections that we heard. And, and I think that one of the most important things is that as we were engaged in this process, uh, more and more of the complaints were along the lines of, well, this this might be the right thing to do, but you can't do it. Uh, that it's logistically something that's impossible. And so that also motivated our efforts in, in writing From Here to Equality was to lay out a plan for how you might actually execute a reparations program. Uh, I think that many of these kinds of complaints arise out of misperceptions. Uh, I'll, I'll mention a couple, and then I, I, Kirsten may may want to talk about a couple of the others. Uh, but the the argument that you know no one who is living was enslaved, and no one who is living was an enslaver, is actually largely irrelevant to the case that we make, and it's irrelevant to the case that we make because of two factors. Uh, the first factor is. Uh, the effects of, of slavery in the United States persist. And, it, and those effects persist in large measure because the United States never has provided restitution for slavery, which has created a huge disadvantage for uh, black American families in terms of transmitting resources to subsequent generations. Uh, we like to say that the racial wealth gap is the best economic indicator of the cumulative intergenerational effects of white supremacy in the United States. And so uh, while slavery is not something that is continuing in the present moment, uh, it is something that still has ongoing effects. Uh, but secondly, related to that point, our case for reparations is not predicated on slavery alone. Uh, the case that we make for reparations is based upon the, uh, the, the nearly century long period of legal segregation in the United States. And actually that period of time is longer than the period of time in which slavery was legal in the United States of America. Uh, and so, uh, so that's a second dimension. And then the third period is the, uh, the period in the aftermath of the civil rights legislation where we have ongoing mass incarceration, sustained police executions of unarmed blacks, actually the contemporary version of lynchings. Uh, we have uh, ongoing discrimination in credit, housing and employment markets. And as we pointed out, uh, the signal dimension that's relevant to our approach to executing reparations is the, uh, is the, is the immense racial wealth gap. Um, the other thing that we actually talk about explicitly in the book is the notion that affirmative action is not reparations. Uh, 
and that affirmative action is not designed to address the racial wealth gap. If anything, affirmative action could enhance incomes by providing people with occupational opportunities that they would otherwise be excluded from. And so uh, affirmative action functions as an anti-discrimination measure, uh, a measure that's supposed to promote inclusion, uh, but it can't have any significant effect on the racial wealth differential, which is something that must be addressed by a reparations project. Yeah, we, we often uh, have conversations with, with, with um, you know, people who are not that familiar with their own history. And, um, you know, back to this question about, you know, I, you know, there are no, no people, there are no slaves living today, there are no slaveholders living today, but there absolutely are white people who benefited from slavery. And there absolutely are black people who are still suffering from the effects of it. Um, but we would say, first of all, you know, in, interrogate your own family history and find out, you know, whether or not you are descended from slaveholders. Uh, the numbers are staggering. Uh, across the country, you're looking at 8%, and that's North and South, East and West. But if you're talking about the South, you're talking about 22% of all households. Yeah, white households. Uh, white households. Yeah. So, and, but, but if you're talking about- At the time uh, of the Civil uh, War. During the, right before the Civil War yeah. um, ended. But when you look at Mississippi and South Carolina specifically, you're talking over 50% of white households owned at least one black body. Um, that, I think that's something that's just not widely uh, widely known, uh, but this is this is essential information, you know, for all of us to 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 grasp. And the other point would be to, to find out how many people uh, in your family, this is white people, uh, benefited from the Homestead Acts. Uh, you know, this single government policy dramatically changed the face of this country for changes geographically, but also dramatically altered the economic position of white Americans. Uh, we know that. Uh, 1.5 million households received, white households received those land grants. And that translates to about 45 million individuals today who are still reaping the benefits of that single government policy. You know, so we would, you know, to, to, to white people who say, well, you know, we've worked hard for what, we've, for what we have, and white people just haven't worked hard enough. You know, we would say, you know, find out whether or not part of, you know, a big part of what your family possesses today is a consequence of uh, enslavement of Black Americans, is a consequence of uh, the Homestead Acts, is a consequence of white violence, white massacres. Like, you know, it's, uh, we recently learned that um, in Wilmington, North Carolina, uh, over, over 200, I almost want to say 400 white men signed a decree, uh, you know, declaring that uh, white men should be the rulers uh, in Wilmington, um, look them up. You know, are your your, your grandparents, great grandparents, uh, you know, signatories on that on that declaration? That would be an important thing to know because Wilmington is one of those places where the black people of uh, the, particularly the black people who were active uh, in politics, but not just them, uh, were run out of town. Their homes burned to the ground. Their businesses burned to the ground, and their properties were. Uh, you know, confiscated, appropriated by white people. You know, did your family benefit from the GI Bill, mm -hmm. from the, um, the the Federal Housing Authority uh, acts? Did your family, um, you know, uh, did you also have, um, you know, opportunities to benefit most more recently, most recently from uh, the bank bailouts? I mean, these are all policies that the federal government has consistently, uh, you know, put in place when 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 needed, uh, but they disadvantaged black people when they invested in whiteness. You can do both. You know, we're not uh, we're not begrudging uh, these white Americans these opportunities and these advantages. We simply think that they should also have been made available to black American descendants of U.S. slavery. Uh, thank you so much. This will be my last question before I uh, turn it over to uh, the questions that are coming from the audience, and I see that there are quite quite a few. But it really is just to kind of lay out your reparations plan. Uh, and again, I know that this, this idea of search your history is important because that is kind of where it begins being able to demonstrate that, again, you have roots that go back to slavery uh, in this country. But again, just the, the specificity of it so that, again, people understand it's not just about um, what could be done, but here's a way that it should be done. 
So I think we'd like to highlight uh, four characteristics of a reparations program that we think are, are essential. And the first is uh, being specific about who would be eligible to receive the reparations payments. And uh, for our purposes, we argue that uh, individuals would have to establish that they satisfied two criteria. Uh, the first of these would be an individual would have to show that they have at least one ancestor who was enslaved in the United States of America. The second uh, is a, a condition that we, uh, we, ident we, we say an individual would have to have self-reported or self-classified themselves as Black, Negro, African American, or Afro-American for at least 12 years before the adoption of a federal reparations program or uh, 12 years before uh, the formation of a commission to study a federal reparations program, whichever comes first. Uh, the first of these we say is a lineage standard and the second is an identity standard. An individual would have to meet both of those conditions to be eligible to receive reparations from the United States government for uh, the purposes of restitution to the African-American community. Uh, the second condition is that the uh, reparations plan needs to be designed in such a way that it brings black American assets up to a level that would equate the black level of wealth with the average level of wealth that's held by white Americans. Uh, so it's elimination of the racial wealth gap as the, uh, the second central attribute a, uh, of a reparations plan. And that's where we estimate that the cost would be at least $11 trillion. Uh, the third uh, characteristic of the plan must be uh, a, an, a prioritization of giving the uh, payments from the reparations fund uh, to uh, the eligible recipients as direct transfers. Uh, this may or may not mean that these would be cash transfers. I mean, we certainly are very, very receptive to the idea of providing these transfers in less liquid form, uh, you know, perhaps a trust account or perhaps uh, an endowment or some mix of that for the amount that needs to be transferred. Uh, but we think it's absolutely essential that the individual recipients have discretion over the use of the funds, just as uh, recipients of reparations payments in other circumstances have had full discretion over the use of the funds. Uh, and we would count here as examples, uh, the German government's payments to the victims of the Holocaust. We would count here the United States government's payments to Japanese Americans who were unjustly incarcerated during the course of World War II but also instances in when the, which the United States government has made payments to victimized communities, uh, regardless of whether or not the United States government was actually the culpable party. Uh, and here we would include uh, the payments that were made to families that lost loved ones during the course of the 911 terrorist attacks, the payments that were made to uh, the uh, victims of the Boston Marathon bombing, and uh, another instance that I think people are rarely familiar with uh, the provision of payments to the individuals who were taken hostages in Iran. Uh, and those are uh, those were what ten thousand dollars a day and the individuals were held hostage for 444 days. So each of them receives 4.4 million dollars. So um, we, we think that, you know nobody has ever raised a question about who should make a decision about the use of the funds that are received in the context of reparations payments. And they only seem to raise that question when we start talking about reparations for black Americans. Uh, and so we, we fundamentally believe that this, these funds should be something that the individual recipients should be able to decide how to use on their own. And then the fourth and final characteristic is that it's the federal government that needs to uh, to make the payment. It's the federal government that needs to make to, to meet the debt. And this is for two reasons. One, the federal government is the culpable party. It is the party that has engineered and supported the policies that created the racial wealth differential. And it's the federal government that has the capacity to do it. Uh, so just for uh, illustrative purposes, 
If we were to take the budgets of all state and local governments in the United States and add them up, it would amount to about $3.1 trillion. Uh, we've already said that the requirement, the minimal requirement for a reparations plan would be $11 trillion. So all state and local governments would have to devote their entire budgets to a reparations fund for upwards of four years to get close to the $11 trillion figure. And so uh, that's, that's an impossibility. So it's the federal government who has the responsibility and it's the federal government that has the capability. So I'm going to paraphrase one of the questions since uh, we're talking about the federal government's role. And um, the, the question is roughly, given that there's, there's so much animus around the, um, the infrastructure plan, the COVID-19 plan, uh, why would we expect elected officials to support uh, legislation for reparations uh, this time? Well, I think it is uh, indeed the case that we need to, you know, to educate our elected officials about the, you know, how important these measures are to us. Um, you know, I actually, you know, my understanding is that there's been less um, sort of less hostility to some of the programs that uh, you know President Biden has put forth uh, than than might be expected, uh, in part because people are really hurting, and uh, and and they need support, they need help, and so you know I, I don't know that that the situation is quite as as dire as we might imagine uh, imagine that it is. Um, did you say something about? Well, I, I think federal measures? federal officials, like any elected officials, respond to political. Uh, political pressure. Mm -hmm. So we actually need a movement, uh, a national movement to support uh, reparations for Black American descendants of U.S. slavery, uh, a movement that would, uh, that might result in electing different officials. Uh, you know, I, we don't necessarily expect the current Congress to pass a reparations plan, uh, but we would have hopes that a future Congress that would be uh, a product of a social movement to support reparations uh, would be more likely to do so. We absolutely encourage individuals to lobby and petition Congress uh, and, and ask them to support a program of reparations for Black American descendants of US slavery. I'm gonna combine a couple of questions that really talk about um, how to execute or how to implement one specific question talked about how do you work with um, libraries and other entities in terms of you know, kind of helping with the genealogies to figure out who would be eligible uh, for reparations. Uh, the, the second part of the question was again, how do you think about uh, implementation? I know that you go into some detail uh, in the book in terms of again, how you think it might work, but uh, for those who haven't read the book, some of those specifics in terms of again, uh, how to make it work. And I'm adding something else since we're an institution of higher education. Yes. You talk about the importance of education and the fact that people just don't know. And so how do we justify the continued not knowing in this society? So one of the things that we talk about in From Here to Equality is the need for a national education campaign. Um, you know, in Conversation after conversation, we're learning that you know Americans don't know our history, um, and that is it's not our fault entirely. Um, you know the uh, the textbooks that many of us uh, were exposed to were textbooks that were commissioned by groups like the United Daughters of the Confederacy and the American Daughters of the Republic, and these were tomes that were written with an eye toward whitewashing our history, uh, to romancing and romanticizing slavery um, and you know, making the Civil War you know, look like this lost cause and the, the aggression of the North um, and not uh, you know, being clear that it was about the maintenance of the institution of slavery so that they could continue the way of life to which they had been accustomed and to re continue to profit from the unremunerated labors of black people. Um, you know, so we definitely advocate for um, a complete telling of our history, not 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 select parts, but going back and looking at the uh, the primary documents 
and and and, and this is, this should be a, an, an effort that goes from you know K twelve all the way to college level. But I think that's a really really important piece of it. Uh, the other part too is you know how we how we frame you know things like our historic landmarks. Um, you know uh, what is a Middleton Plantation in South Carolina. Uh, is a big wedding destination site. Um, and, you know, I think part of the allure, part of the attraction uh, for this idyllic space is, you know, these young uh, brides and grooms imagining themselves in that plantation site. So this is something that, um, you know, needs to really be grappled with head on. Mm -hmm. but, um, but from the standpoint of libraries, um, and and education, absolutely. We think that librarians uh, could play a tremendous role. I have a, a soft place in my heart for libraries, one of the most democratic institutions we have, libraries and the post offices. Well, except under segregation. <laughs> there was that. <laughs> but, um, but in this moment, um, you know, these are absolutely um, spaces and places where these kinds of conversations can be held. I think it's also important to um, to note that we believe that a reparations commission also would include agencies that were, um, you know, run by professionally changing, trained genealogists who would assist individuals uh, in their search and their research to determine whether or not they were eligible for reparations and that these services should be provided to them free of charge. Well, I just would like to pay back on Kirsten's comment about the educational dimension. Uh, I think it's critical that uh, so much of what we know about slavery, the Civil War, and Reconstruction is a consequence of a false narrative that has been crafted primarily by the United Daughters of the Confederacy and the Daughters of the American Revolution, who have had a tremendous influence on what is taught in our schools, what textbooks we read, and the like. And uh, one of the consequences has been a romanticization of the Confederacy mm -hmm. and the treatment of the Confederacy as an honorable movement that was intended to preserve states' rights. Uh, when, in fact, if we look at what the Confederate officials themselves said, it's quite explicit that they were uh, that their purpose was to maintain slavery. And the formation of the Confederacy itself was an act of traitorship against the Republic. And so it should be understood in that way. Uh, can, can, can we imagine a situation in which post-World War II Germany erected statues to uh, the former Nazis? Uh, well, uh, we, we can't, it didn't happen, but we have erected statues to traitors to the Republic throughout the United States. You know, and the work that the sort of denazification uh, was not happenstance. I mean, it was a, a very organized, uh, laborious process. Uh, not not a perfect process by any means. I'm sure, uh, you know, uh, members of the German public would say, you know, yes, there's a lot of work to be done and things that they might have done differently. But we've not begun the process of deconfederalization in the United States, and that is something that absolutely needs to happen. Uh, thank you. I think I have maybe time for one or two more questions, and so. Um, again, I'm trying to do compound questions. Um, so this is another one around uh, reparations and, and it talks about reparations for Native Americans, reparations for people that have been victims of uh, redlining. And are you concerned about um, reparations in Evanston being paid with cannabis money? So I'm going to take part of this and say, I'm going to give you the Native American uh, piece. So it's a, it's a, it's a fun question. <laughs> <laughs> so the Evanston, Illinois case uh, is really a racial equity uh, program. Uh, this is, uh, for those of you who are not familiar with it, uh, Evanston, Illinois uh, decided to um, create fund to uh, provide support for Black, fam black households that it discriminated against uh, in the housing markets between 1919 and 1969. They set aside a fund that so far has $400,000. Um, I think ultimately uh, they've capped the fund at $10 million and 10 years. And the idea is that $25,000 grants will be made available to those individuals, black households that were discriminated against by the city. Um, 
Funds can be used for the down payment on a new house in Evanston or for repair and maintenance on the existing house. Um, so the question that we have is, you know, why is this being called reparations? It's not going to change the, um, the racial wealth gap. Uh, this is a goodwill program that, you know, I think is something that they should do. Um, you know, we talk about um, a quote from Malcolm X where he says, you know, if you plunge a knife, you know, uh, nine inches into my back and you pull it out three inches, uh, I've got a little bit of relief, but the knife is still there. If you pull it out six inches, there's a bit more relief. If you pull the knife all the way out, there's a great deal of relief, but the wound, the open wound is still gaping. And so for us, these different programs, uh, like the Evanston uh, uh, housing voucher, which is masquerading as reparations, it's like pulling the knife out three inches, or, or the program with Asheville, North Carolina, that is going to uh, be more equanimical in naming black, uh, well, actually they don't say black people, they say minorities to its committees and commissions. Um, or you know, groups that are uh, setting up scholarship funds or, or taking the names of uh, slaveholders off of public buildings or taking down the pictures, the portraits of uh, you know, Ku Klux Klan members from their city halls and their county courthouses. These are all important uh, uh, actions that we support, but they are racial equity initiatives and not reparations. And I think the two should be, you know, we need to be really clear uh, that you know, they're, they're, these racial equity initiatives are targeted at specific communities. You know, the, Rep the Evanston, uh, Illinois program is not going to affect people in Los Angeles. Uh, you know, they're not going to go out and find, uh, as far as they've not done a feasibility study. So, as far as we know, there's no uh, plan to identify people who left Evanston who might have qualified. Um, but, you know, they're not direct payments. You know, those $25,000 grants in Evanston will go directly to the bank. You know, the residents in Evanston won't, won't get that money. They can't say to them, they can't say, oh, I'd rather put this money on my child's college education, or I'd rather pay a doctor bill with this. It can only be used for housing program. Now, it's interesting, too, um, this $25,000 that could be put toward a down payment. The um, the median household, I'm sorry, the median price of a house, a new house in Edmondson is $423,000. So if you were expected to come up with a 20% down payment, that's closer to $70,000. So you can't even use it unless you also happen to have an extra $50,000 lying around that you can put toward this uh, down payment. So no, this is absolutely not reparations and should not be characterized as such. You know, I'd like to reemphasize, as, as we pointed out earlier, uh, that it's impossible for all of the states and, uh, and, and municipalities in the United States to actually meet the bill for reparations because uh, their budgetary capacity doesn't, doesn't, uh, doesn't enable that. And they are constrained by their tax revenue in the way in which the federal government is not. Uh, with respect to redlining, uh, so Redlining is 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 a process that has had a, a its most adverse effect on Black Americans, and it's embodied in the consequent racial wealth differential. Uh, and so, as a consequence, to the extent that we address the racial wealth gap, we are addressing the adverse effects of of redlining. Um, and then, uh, I think that the initial phase of the question concerned reparations for Native Americans. Uh, we're absolutely convinced that Native Americans have a case for reparations, as do some other communities in the United States. And, uh, and we encourage everyone who has a claim to come forward. It is not the claim that we have worked on. And, uh, and we think that it's somewhat inappropriate to raise the question about what other groups or communities might deserve when a particular community brings forth a claim. Uh, when the Japanese American claim for restitution was made, other people didn't ask at that time, well, what about Black Americans or what about Native Americans? And they shouldn't have. I mean, there's a, a claim that stands on its own terms that needs to be addressed for moral and equity reasons by the national government. And so, uh, 
yes, Native Americans have a claim. It's a claim for sovereignty rather than the claim, uh, the focus of the claim for Black American descendants of US slavery for the material conditions for full citizenship. Uh, but, but they are not claims that should be wrapped together. And thank you so much for an amazing session. Uh, we're coming to an end. Uh, before we go, there's actually a polling question that you're gonna receive. And I hope that you will take the time uh, to respond to the question. I was supposed to ask this long ago, but I was too in the moment uh, to, do my <laughs> to do my moderator duties because I've totally, um, it's been totally fascinating. Please uh, go ahead and complete the, the poll. But again, thank you for sharing your amazing work uh, with the, mem the extended uh, membership of the Price School family. Um, it's been delightful. Uh, we celebrate your work uh, and hopefully uh, we'll get to talk again. Uh, so thank you so much. And again, thank you for all your time, everyone. All right, take care, everybody. Thanks for having us. <laughs> thank you.